Welcome to the Literary Kill Count. Here, we grab the literary abacus and see who gets put on the slabicus. Today, we'll be looking at Porfirio's Lover, a dramatic monologue by English poet and playwright Robert Browning, who kind of looks like a Victorian Danny Trejo. Robert Browning was born in London, England, and he began writing at around the age of 12. He was SMRT smart. He had become fluent in Latin, Greek, French, and Italian by the age of 14. He'd go on to marry the poet Elizabeth Barrett, the other half of one of literature's most famous power couples, even though his own work wouldn't get critically recognized until later in his life. Porfiria's Lover was published in 1835, which means that Bobby Browning and his macabre American counterpart, Edgar Allan Poe, were creeping out the peeps at roughly the same time. Gothic Brothers by Different Mothers. Browning was the spooky pioneer of the dramatic monologue form, which features a speaker first personing in an emotionally charged situation. Like being back crap and zane, maybe. Porfirius Lover, amazingly his first go at the form, is a creepy little poem about a girlie named Porfiria who goes home to her wackadoodle-doo boyfriend with disastrous results. How many deaths does this Victorian masterpiece rack up? Let's break out the abacus and find out. It was a dark and stormy night, and the forecast apparently called for personification because the wind is sullen, knocking down treetops just for kicks and vexing the lake. Take that, stupid sexy lake. Inside, we meet our speaker, whose name we never learn. We're going to call him Rudy, because this sad sack is all like, my name is Rudy, and I likes to broody. Anyway, he's sitting at home, all alone, listening with heart fit to break. Then, Porphyria glides in, straight out of the storm. We find out later there was a party, and either Rudy was there and left early, or didn't go, period. Whichever it is, one thing is clear. Porphyria's got herself a weird name. It's a rare blood disease, and aside from severe abdominal pain, nausea, and oversensitivity to sunlight, it can also cause hallucinations and paranoia, which opens the poem up to approximately a metric crap tons worth of speculation and interpretation. Porphyria, apparently suspecting nothing, decides being cold and wet is no longer a condition she wants to tolerate, goes all Bob Cratchit, and puts more coals in the furnace. As a result, it gets nice and toasty in the room. She's still dripping wet, so it's off with the cloak and shawl, off with the gloves, and she unties her hat, ooh la la. She sits down next to Rudy, and it looks like maybe the two might be down for the Victorian equivalent of Netflix and chill. Maybe whist and chill, or Play the spinet in chill. So P-Girl gets all up into Rudy's business because she wants some snuggles. But Rudy, who's kind of moody, comes back at her with the whole silent treatment instead. Even though we're treated to some pretty hot language from Browning. Made her smooth white shoulder bare. If you know what I mean, and I think you do. Porphyria continues to lay on her charms, trying to get Rudy to stop being such a big pouty baby, and admits that yes, she may get distracted by surfacey things from time to time, but she does love him, the big grumpy galoot. la di da Porphyria likes to party. She don't want to hurt nobody, she says, especially Rudy. After all, she traipsed through the cold and rain to be with him right now, and Rudy finally gets it, kind of. He looks at her, happy and proud. At last he knows that Porphyria worshipped him. Yeah, that's a little weird. Rudy, who's clearly a little loco in La Cabeza, gets to thinking, you know, I wish there were a way to make this perfect moment last forever. Oh! Light bulb. And this is where things go all Tarantino in the cottage arena. Rudy, matter-of-factly, takes Porfiria's long hair, wraps it around her neck three times, 
and pulls the train into Strangulation Station for our first and only kill. And if that's not a recommendation against the Crystal Gale hairstyle in lieu of a pixie cut, I don't know what is. Porphyria's brown eyes were already blue, but now they're X's because poor Judd is dead. Still, Rudy may not be totally cool with what he just did because he feels the need to say twice, no pain felt she, I am quite sure she felt no pain. Way to stick the landing there, buddy. Rudy decides to check those lids and see what's going on in there, if anything. He warily opens no longer here he is eyelids, the way somebody would open a flower bud with a bee in it. And when nothing happens, he concludes that everything is okie dokie. She's okie dokie. <laughs> he unloosens the old hair noose and gives his now permanent girlfriend a kiss on the cheek. She puts her head on his shoulder, because she's super dead and has no choice, and Rudy reflects on how happy he is that Porphyria has got everything she wanted now, namely him. Maybe not in the way she expected, and Rudy channels his inner Pietro Maximov. You didn't see that coming? The poem ends with Rudy and Porphyria just chillaxing on the couch, and he's feeling pretty good. Don't know if it's the insanity talking, but God must be ah uh, igget with the murderin', cause he ain't said jack about it. I'm no psychologist, but I do have a master's in English literature, and it's my professional opinion that the speaker of this poem is completely a cuckoo bananas. The fact that Rudy thinks God approves of what he did is just messed up as fudge. There was only one kill in this 60-line poem, and that was Porphyria, who was strangled with her own hair. In literature, every death is supposed to mean something, so I don't feel bad about the just one kill. For the English major nerds out there, our rhyme scheme is a consistent ABABB, and our meter was filmed in glorious iambic tetrameter. Kill of the day goes to the titular Porphyria, who is straight up strangulated with her own yellow tresses. And that's all for Robert Browning and Porphyria's Lover. It's been heavily anthologized in Britlet textbooks for years. And although he's not on the level of a Shakespeare or a Milton, he is one of the giants of Victorian poetry. I don't know when our next episode will be, or on what it will be, or by whom it will be, but before I go, a debt of gratitude to James A. Janice and his highly entertaining kill count over on the Dead Meat channel, which I tried, perhaps unsuccessfully, to not to steal too much from for this concept. Now, if you love horror cinema and friendly commentary and counting people who die, James is your guy. Second only, perhaps, to the great Joe Bob Briggs himself. This has been Mr. Cell Ghost Dog for Literary Kill Count. One last word. If you're watching this, you're flippin' awesome. And if you're not watching this, well, you're still flippin' awesome. It's been heavily anthologized in British Britlet. Ba-dee-da-bee-da-doo!